Welcome to The Unrealist. This is Chris. This is another installment in my recreated series, where I show you how to recreate visual effects and other behavior from video games and other interactive experiences. Today we'll be recreating the tunnel vision travel effect from Google Earth VR. This is a really clever and useful technique for allowing VR players to move freely without experiencing VR sickness. The effect accomplishes this in a couple of ways. First, the player's field of view is artificially reduced while moving. Also, color and detail is removed from the player's peripheral vision and replaced with a grid representing the player's play area. This grid gives the player a stationary point of reference even while they're moving through the virtual space. I'm starting here with a base project I've put together for us to play with. I'm using the excellent Landscape Mountains content that Epic makes available through the Epic Launcher in the Learn section. You'll find more details in the notes accompanying this video. Also, I've made this project available through GitHub. You'll find that link in the notes as well. I've already created a simple VR pawn for us to use, which allows you to fly through the 3D environment using a Vive controller by pressing the touchpad button and pointing the controller in any direction. This is similar to how the Earth VR controls work. Let's take a look at that so you can see it in action. Let's edit our pawn to start building that world grid. One thing you'll notice right away is the Vive controller meshes are really large. I've given them a scale of 50. This is because in the world settings, I've set the VR world to meters to 5,000 to give us that effect that the landscape is actually miniature. So in order to counterbalance that, I've scaled the controllers up. This is not something you necessarily have to do when creating this effect. I've just done it here to more closely match the Google Earth example. We're going to zoom out quite a bit and add a static mesh that will represent the bounds of our play area. In addition to that static mesh, I'm going to also add a scene component and place the static mesh within it. This is just a simple trick that I'm using so that I can scale the bounds mesh from a defined anchor point. In order to set that anchor point, I'm just going to offset the Z location of my mesh so that the bottom of the mesh is exactly at the zero Z location of the world. There, now we can resize our bounds mesh easily while still guaranteeing that the bottom of the mesh is always at Z0. With the bounds component selected, let's scale it up to 40. The next step is to create a new material that we can apply to this bounds mesh. Now let's apply the material to the bounds mesh. I've created this simple grid texture which we'll use in our material. We'll open the material for editing and then drag our grid texture into the material. For now, we'll connect the output of that texture to our base color pin on the material. We'll want this material to have translucency, so with the material node selected, set its blend mode to translucent. For now, we can hard code an opacity value just so we can check and make sure it's working the way we want it to. We'll save the material, and now we can see it in effect in our main viewport. You'll notice that when we move inside the bounds mesh, that it disappears. Let's fix that. Since we want to be able to see our grid material while we're inside the mesh, we'll select the material node and make sure it's set to two-sided. Now our bounds area is looking more like we expect it to. We want our grid to look like it extends infinitely off into the distance, 
So let's take the scale of our bounds mesh and increase it significantly. That's more like what we need, but now the scale of the grid lines themselves is off. We want that grid pattern to tile quite a bit. It's easy to do this. We just add a texture coordinate node and set the U tiling and V tiling to appropriate values. When we connect the texture coordinate output to the UV input of the texture sample and then save our material, you can see the effect is exactly what we want in the viewport. Okay, so we're making good progress, but what you might notice is that our grid goes behind the landscape in some areas. This isn't actually what we want. We wanna always be able to see the grid, even if there's landscape in the way. So let's make some modifications to our material. Select the material node, and then move over to the translucency section of the settings. If you don't already have the advanced options expanded, go ahead and expand them clicking the little down arrow. We want to turn on the Disable Depth Test option. As the tooltip explains, this will force the material to draw over top of any opaque pixels in our scene. We'll save the material, and you can see in the viewport that our grid now is always visible. Let's preview this in VR to see the full effect with player movement. So we've got our basic grid in place. Now, let's start making it look more like the Google Earth VR example. We'll remove some of the temporary connections we made previously. With the material nodes selected, Set its shading model to unlit. We don't want our material to be affected by environmental lighting. We'll create a couple vector parameter nodes to set the colors of our grid. One node will represent the base color of our grid. and the other will represent the colors of the lines themselves. We'll then add a linear interpolate or lerp node. Lerp nodes let you mix two colors together. The amount of each color is determined by the value you feed into the alpha pin. So a value of zero would be completely the first color, and a value of one would be completely the second color. In this case, we'll use the grid texture itself to determine which color will be displayed. Connect this to the emissive color pin on our material, and we can see the result in the preview window. Save the material, and you can see the result in the viewport. Now you'll notice that all of the terrain is obscured now because nothing is transparent yet. That's okay, we'll get there eventually. For the next step, I want the grid lines to appear like they're fading off in the distance. To do this, we'll use a special node called a camera depth fade. The camera depth fade node outputs a value between zero and one, where zero represents something that's immediately in front of the camera, and one represents a certain distance away from the camera, which we set through the fade length pin on the node. Let's create a scalar value node. And call it grid fade length. This will be the distance over which the fade happens in world units. In this case, since my environment is really large scale, I'll want to use a really large number for the grid fade length. The way we'll achieve the fade is by multiplying the texture output by the camera depth fade output. 
But the output of camera depth fade is actually the inverse of what we want. It goes from zero to one, and we really want it to go from one to zero. It's easy to fix that. We just insert a one minus node. So we'll wire up the result of this multiplication to our alpha input on our LERP. Now in our viewport, you can see that we get a nice gradual fade off into the distance. Our material is still completely opaque, so we can't see the terrain behind it. So let's poke some holes in the material to reveal the terrain. I've created a special black and white mask in an external graphics program to represent the restricted field of view for each eye. You'll notice that the circle for each eye is positioned slightly toward the center. This is because our eyes never look completely straight ahead, parallel to each other. They're always pointed in just a little bit, depending on what we're focused on in the distance. The positioning I've come up with here was mostly through trial and error and feels good for this particular use. But for your own applications, you may have to adjust that positioning. We'll drag and drop this mask texture into our material, then connect one of its output channels directly to the opacity of our material. In our viewport, you can see it's not exactly what we were going for. It's cutting holes in each side of our mesh. We want the holes to be cut relative to the viewport itself or the camera. Accomplishing this is very easy. We just insert a screen position node, and we use that to drive the UV position of the texture. I've just closed and reopened Unreal Engine, just because when using screen position, it sometimes doesn't render properly if your viewport is scaled way down like I have in this example. But regardless, it would work properly at runtime. So now you can see, no matter where we aim the camera, the cutouts still appear in the appropriate place. Let's preview in VR to see our progress. It's looking pretty good, but one thing you'll notice is that our controllers are also being masked by this tunnel vision. We want to be able to see the controllers at all times, so let's address that next. For this next step, we have to make a small adjustment to our VR pawn. I'll select one of the controller meshes and find its rendering settings, and I'll expand to reveal the advanced settings. We're going to turn on a feature called Render Custom Depth Pass. We'll do this for both meshes. To see what we gain by enabling this custom depth pass, let's take a look at its output. We'll add a scene texture node to our material. And with that node selected, we'll choose from the drop down custom depth. The custom depth texture is essentially a map of every pixel that makes up the screen and the pixel value is a number that represents how far away that pixel is from the camera. So something right up against the camera would have a value of zero or black, and something with a very large number would be off in the distance, say a value of 30,000. In order to bring this into a range that we can see, I'm gonna multiply the output by a very small number. And we'll temporarily connect that to the emissive color output just so you can see it in action. Now if we preview the project, when I move the controller around, you can see it gets darker as it gets closer to the camera and lighter as it gets further away. But we're only seeing the controller. We're not seeing any of our terrain. That's because the controllers are the only things we've marked to render to this custom depth. So we can use this custom depth information to create an additional mask that pokes holes in our material to let the controllers show through. To do this, we'll add an if node. And we'll need just one color channel from the custom depth. So I'll apply a mask with only the R value enabled. 
and we'll connect that to the A value of our if. And the second value of our if that we'll be comparing against, we're going to call horizon distance. And we'll set this to a value of 50,000. If our custom depth value is greater than the horizon distance, then we want the output to be the regular output value that we already set up with our mask. But if the custom depth value is less than the horizon distance, we want to output a value of zero or completely transparent. Now let's take another look in VR. Now you can see the controller is always visible because its custom depth is being used to add complete transparency where needed. The material as it is now could be used easily in any project and it would work well with interior scenes or exterior scenes. But I do want to show you an advanced version I created which more closely matches what Google Earth VR does. One of the features of Google Earth VR's effect is that it never restricts view of the sky or the horizon. This is nice because what the user sees then feels a little bit more open, but still doesn't have any risk of causing motion sickness. So I'm going to swap out the material on our bounds mesh with the enhanced version of the material that I've created previously. In the viewport, you can see that the detail from the mountains is removed, but we can still see all of the sky. The way I'm accomplishing this is really just a variation on the way that we showed the controllers. Instead of using custom depth, I'm using the full scene depth. This is the depth of everything in the scene. So anything that is beyond the horizon, like our sky sphere, I'm allowing to show through completely. Anything that is closer than the horizon just falls back to the previous logic that we've created. Here you can see the effect in action. Now that we have our material completed, Let's finish things up by making the effect only active while the player is actually moving. If you look at the VR pawn, you'll see that we have a player is moving Boolean value. This is automatically set to true while the player is moving and false when the player is stopped. So we'll add a reference to our bounds mesh and we'll set its visibility to whatever the moving value is. Now let's take a look at the finished effect in action. That's it for this installment of our recreated series. If you have other effects you'd like to see recreated, leave them in the comments and try to include a video sample if you can. I hope you find this technique useful and if you come up with an interesting use for it, I'd love to see your work. Until next time, this has been Chris.